All right, we started off here in Proverbs chapter number 18. The verse I'm going to be focusing on this morning is verse number 13. The Bible says, He that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. And the title of my sermon this morning is Don't Be Hasty. Don't be hasty. You shouldn't just be real quick with everything. And there's, there's multiple things that, that we're going to be looking at. And the first thing is just being real quick to, to judge and to, and to um, come to conclusion, especially on matters that require a little bit more uh, thought. Now, there are some things that are very black and white, right? Raping somebody. There's, there's not like, you're not going to be hasty in judgment to just be like, that's wicked, that's wrong. Very clear in Scripture, right? I mean, you've got the Ten Commandments. You've got things that it's just, I mean, it's spelled out. So when I'm talking about not being hasty, I'm not just talking about the real, simple, basic truths of Scripture. I'm talking about going a little bit deeper in some areas, and especially when it comes to, you know, judging is, is one area here, or answering a matter before you hear it. We see this all the time. This, ver this one verse pops into my head just regularly when I go out soul winning. You know, people who are just like, before you even get a chance to get anything out of your mouth, it's just, boom, slam the door. Boom, I don't want to talk, you know, just don't want to hear anything of it, right? The people just, you're, you're trying to bring them good news, you're trying to bring them the gospel, you're trying to share something with them, show them, hey, maybe, you know, and people just, oh, no, I've already read the Bible before. I know what the Bible says. You know, that's, that's a foolish attitude to have of just blowing things off of, of just, well, I don't really want to hear what you have to say because, you know, I, I, I've heard it before. Or not, not even just I've heard it before. You see, if you heard something, if you truly heard something before, that's not being hasty or wrong either. I mean, if you, if you see, search something out and seek it out, um, obviously you want to, you could give someone an opportunity, give a chance, hey, if you, you know, what do you have to say? But... There are patterns that you can find in, in uh, and I'm, I'm being a little vague right now, but um, flip over, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 25. We need to be able to listen. I mean, we, we expect people, we want people to listen to us, right, when we go out and preach the gospel. So you don't want to just be too quick on making a decision about something or making a judgment, especially like on doctrine and things like that, you want to be able to listen and not just answer before the person's even done speaking. Right? Give a chance to hear what's being said because it is folly and shame, according to the scripture, to just answer a matter before you hear it. Now, again, don't be confused with people who have already heard. See, I think sometimes people might go, well, Pastor Burzins, you know, you answer a matter before you hear it. And it may be perceived that way sometimes, but you got to understand when there's certain subjects, like if someone's going to try to teach me or tell me that you have to repent of your sins to be saved, or some other doctrines, or Calvinism, or just, just other core doctrines. Look, I've looked into these thoroughly. I look into matters, and you know whether or not you know how much research I've done doesn't mean necessarily that I'm answering a matter before hearing it if I know where you're going, if you start to use all these same arguments that other people are using, no, 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 you see, you don't understand, repent of your sins isn't works because I don't need to hear all the reasons why you're saying it's not works when I've already studied it out and know that it's works, right? So I just want to make sure I'm really clear when it comes to these scriptures, what I'm referring to, what I'm talking about. On matters that you don't know, Especially, you don't want to just be so quick to answer a matter before you hear it. Hear it out. Give an opportunity to hear. I mean, everyone who's saved had to do that, at least for receiving salvation. You had to hear the matter before making a decision upon it, whether it's right or wrong. Proverbs chapter 25, look at verse number 2. The Bible reads, It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. Now, we're going to continue on in this passage, but I just want to explain this one verse real quickly. The Bible says God's glory to conceal a thing. So when God shows mercy and God gives forgiveness and God kind of covers, you know, 
your sins and will forgive you for something that you've done. That's the glory of God for being long suffering, for being merciful, for being able to pass over a thing. But when it comes to human government, when it comes to someone who's in charge, like the king, they need to be able to seek out a matter and not just brush things under the rug and brush them under the carpet and pretend like they didn't happen. You know, they're in a position to seek out justice and that's what they're supposed to do. And oftentimes you'll see, of course, you know, these politicians that with all their friends, yeah, none of them are going to be found guilty of any crimes. They're just going to going to try to hide over that. But um, what their what their duty is to be is to search out a matter. They're supposed to be able to discover the truth and seek out and seek diligently and also not be hasty and not be a respecter of persons. Someone who's a respecter of persons is given more credibility or credence just to who the person is than to what is actually being alleged, you know, what the, the facts are in a case or in a crime or something like that, where it doesn't matter who the person is, it matters what was done and what could be proven. And that's the way that, that God expects, you know, that's the honor of kings. The, the honorable king is the one who's going to search out a matter and seek it out diligently. Look at verse number three. The Bible says, The heaven for height and the earth for depth, and the heart of kings is unsearchable. Take away the dross from the silver, and there shall come forth a vessel for the finer. Take away the wicked from before the king, and his throne shall be established in righteousness. Put not forth thyself in the presence of the king, and stand not in the place of great men. For better it is that it be said unto thee, Come up hither, than that thou shouldest be put lower in the presence of the prince whom thine eyes have seen. Look at verse number 8. Go not forth hastily to strive, lest thou know not what to do in the end thereof, when thy neighbor hath put thee to shame. So here's another area you could be hasty in a matter. It's being hasty to fight. Just being way too quick to get involved in a fight and to start fighting with someone Hear someone out. You know, again, this goes back to the he answered the matter before you hear this folly and shame. Don't be too quick just to get into a fight and just be ready to start swinging, you know, whether it be physically or even just, uh, um, you know, doctrinally, you know, just not, not super fast to fight. He says, lest thou know not what to do in the end thereof when thy neighbor hath put thee to shame. And, you know, we need to be, be sure that we're not jumping in and getting involved with every fight that you ever hear about also. There's a time to fight. And I'm, you know, the Bible says there's going to be strife. There's going to be tribulation. There's going to be division. There's going to be all these things, when you, especially when you live for God, we live for Christ. When you're standing on the truth, God's word divides. And that's a fact. But we also don't need to just start inserting ourselves into the fights and strives that other people are going through or whatever, you know. We've got enough to do to, to stay focused on doing what's right, and we don't need to just be going around and get involved in meddling with everybody else's strife. And it's easy to do these days, especially when it comes to things with social media and YouTube and Facebook and all the other, you know, medium on the internet where you can see what's going on here and what's going on there and get involved in everyone's life. It's like, we really need to learn to just, to, to kind of mind our own business and just be able to keep moving forward and go in the right direction. The Bible says in Proverbs 26, verse 17, He that passeth by and meddleth with strife, belonging not to him, is like one that taketh a dog by the ears. So when there's things going on elsewhere, unless there's anything that pertains to our church really specifically, I try not to get involved in anything that happens outside of our church. Now, if there's people that... You know, if, there, if there's a reason why there's, there's maybe a lot of people in our church that are kind of being influenced from, from sources outside of our church, and I feel like I need to deal with something, then I will deal with it because it affects our church. But if there's something that has nothing to do with us, with our church, with the people here, I'm not going to go and just start getting involved in these fights and these strifes that have nothing to do with us. The Bible says here, look, when, when you're just passing by, you meddle with strife, it, th that doesn't belong to you. But I'll say it's just like taking a dog by the ears. And if you've never had a dog before, you don't want to take a dog by the ears. The reason why you don't take a dog by the ears is because they're going to they're gonna snap at your hand. They're going to try to bite your heart. You know, that you're going to get bit. You're going to get hurt. And that's what happens when you start getting involved in fights that have nothing to do with you. Just stay out of it. You know, we're, we're not here. It, no one needs, you know, you got two people fighting over something. No one asks you your opinion. Right? You don't need to go and just say, well, here's what, what you're both wrong or whatever. You know, like, leave it alone. 
You have plenty of fights to get involved with that'll come to you naturally by preaching the truth. You don't need to start going and finding extra fights to get involved with. So don't go forth hastily to strive. Now, sometimes it's necessary to, to strive, to, to strive for the truth and, and, to, and to stand on the word of God, but you don't just go forth hastily and just, and just, just run out there. Unless you don't know what to do in the end there. Like, like you might get started in something you don't know how to finish just because you got involved super quickly in, in something that it's not going to end well for you and you didn't, you didn't look to the end of the, th of the matter. Flip over, you would please, to Deuteronomy chapter 13. When it comes to people, you know, being quick to judge, another area where I've seen people being quick to judge is also just kind of being quick with your mouth. Right. And, and, and just opening up your mouth and saying things that you ought not to just be saying. And, and, and one of the things that I've seen that, that really bothers me is when people just get real flippant and quick to throw out words or accusations about people without really knowing, without really having proof. And, and the one that bothers me the most is when people just throw around the word reprobate. Just throw it. Just, you don't like what someone said or you disagree with this particular doctrine that they teach. And all of a sudden they're just reprobate. They're just a reprobate, you know. And, and for those of you who don't know what the word reprobate means, the word reprobate means rejected. And we believe in the reprobate doctrine here. Reprobate means someone is beyond redemption, beyond salvation, because for one reason or another, whether they blaspheme the Holy Ghost or, um, you know, just, just completely rejected God, just completely, utterly rejected God, rejected salvation. They heard the truth. They knew who God was. They denied God. They denied salvation. They've in turn become rejected. And if you don't understand what, what I'm talking about, you could, uh, I could point you to some sermons that you could listen to about that. Just keyword search reprobate on our YouTube channel. And you'll be able to find something to teach that. I don't want to go in depth about that this morning. But off, too often times you'll hear people just say, Oh man, that person's just a reprobate. And it's like, you don't know anything about that person. And you're just, you're just gonna, you're just gonna take it upon you to just label that person. Look, that's a serious, that's a serious accusation. And you ought not to be going around and, and putting labels on people, especially when you don't know. Now, I will put the label reprobate on someone that has unnatural affections like they're a homosexual because that is a sin that's not common to man but there's so many other sins that are common to man that that anybody can do that haven't that that's not the total sign that they've been given over to a reprobate mind and i'll tell you what even even some heresies doesn't make someone a reprobate you know, if they believe in, 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 you know, they could be really misled in some doctrine and some belief, but that doesn't make them a reprobate. Even, even doctrines that make someone unsaved doesn't make them a reprobate. You know, you just be like, man, you're not saved if you don't believe that. It's not like every person who doesn't believe in the deity of Christ is a reprobate. Now, I don't believe they're saved, but that doesn't mean they're just, they're just rejected. It doesn't mean they're unredeemable. So we need to be careful when you use these terms. And in Deuteronomy chapter 13, we're going to see here how the Bible says that, that the children of Israel were supposed to deal with someone who's being you know, referred to as children of Belial, a son of the devil, a reprobate, because that's what it is. Being, you know, if you're a son of God, you could never lose that salvation. You're always a son of God. Well, when someone becomes a son of the devil... It's like, it's like a, a born again of Satan. You, know, you have a born again of God. Hey, you're saved, you're sanctified, you're sealed, you're sealed forever, right? Someone who's born of the devil, that's their fate. And it's not a lot of people, but that's their fate. Now, Deuteronomy chapter 13, we're going to start looking at verse number 12. This is how the Bible says to deal with the situation. It says, If thou shalt hear say... In one of thy cities, which the Lord thy God hath given thee to dwell there, saying, 
certain men, the children of Belial, are gone out from among you and have withdrawn the inhabitants of their city, saying, let us go and serve other gods which ye have not known. So he's saying, if it, if it comes here, if you hearsay, you know, we know the word hearsay, it's something that you don't know. You've just heard it said. You've heard other people talking about it and say, hey, there's these children of Belial over here and they're trying to steer people away from the Lord. That's the situation that we're looking at right here. And the accusation is that these guys are children of the devil. And they're trying to steer people away. So if you hear this, he says in verse 14, the Bible says in verse 14, then shalt thou inquire and make search and ask diligently. You don't just go, oh, well, if you said it, then they must be children of Belial. And now we're just going to pass judgment on them. He says, no. no you, that's a serious accusation. He says, you go, you inquire, you start asking questions. You make a diligent search. You find out, is this true? Is this actually the truth? Does that hold water? Are these people really children of Belial? It says, and behold, if it be truth and the thing certain. Certain means without doubt. It is a fact. It is true. You've done enough search to be like this. There is no reasonable doubt here that these people are just really bad reprobates. If it's certain that such abomination is wrought among you, thou shalt surely smite the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, destroying it utterly, and all that is therein, and the cattle thereof with the edge of the sword. Obviously, it's a, it's a very severe punishment coming upon those people. I mean, they're being killed. And that's also the same standard that the Bible has for the death penalty and other things. You have to inquire diligently. Now, obviously, we're not going to go out and actually execute judgment on anybody, on sinners, on, you know, on people uh, doing things that, that the law is supposed to be holding people responsible for. But one thing that a lot of people are doing is just passing the judgment verbally and putting labels on people. And way too many times, they're just going off of hearsay and not going off of what they know to be true. And you're way better off not saying anything than being a false accuser. And that's a serious thing. And I don't have that in my notes, but basically the, the punishment for false accusations in the scripture is whatever the punishment would be for whatever you're accusing somebody of. If you're accusing someone of stealing and it's a false accusation and you know they didn't steal, but you're just accusing them anyways, whatever punishment they would get is the one that you deserve, is the one that you would get. Under God's law, that's what would happen. So if you accuse someone of rape and it was a false accusation, well, the, the, the sentence for rape is death. It's a death penalty. It's a capital crime. If that were fi found out according to God's law that this person is lying about that, that person would be put to death. Even though they didn't commit rape, they didn't do necessarily anything other than make a false accusation. That's a serious crime. According to God saying, look, if you're, if you're willing to have someone else go through whatever that punishment is or whatever that judgment would be, you're deserving of that judgment if you're lying about it. Amen. So be careful with your words. Choose them carefully. Don't just go slapping labels on people when you don't really know. Look at uh, Proverbs chapter 29. Proverbs 29, we're going to look at verse number 20. Proverbs 29, verse number 20, the Bible reads, Seest thou a man that is hasty in his word, so he's quick to speak? There is more hope of a fool than of him. A fool has more hope than a guy that's just real fast to just, just be hasty with their words. And being hasty with your words doesn't necessarily mean that you speak fast, right? Like with, with the tempo or the speed in which you speak. It has to do with the thought going behind the words that are coming out of your mouth. Some people, like uh, my friend Pastor Jimenez, can speak really fast, right? He's a... He, I, 
Sometimes he's hard to follow. Amen. <laughs> we got amen on, on that one. He could speak real fast. But it doesn't mean that there's not thought going into the words that are coming out of his mouth before he speaks, right? Some people are just able to speak faster. We don't want to be hasty in our words in the sense of just not really knowing what you're talking about, but just continuing to talk anyways. There's more hope of a fool than of him. Flip over to Ecclesiastes chapter number 5. Ecclesiastes chapter number 5. Verse number 1, the Bible reads, Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven and now upon earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. This is another admonishment from Scripture. You know, we don't need to go and, and start spouting off our mouth about a lot of things. When you go to church, when you go to the house of God, the Bible says be more ready to hear. Just be ready to receive. Hear from the word of God. And he says then to give the sacrifice of fools. Because a fool's not going to listen. A fool's going to come in, they're going to do their religion thing. They might give some big sacrifice and feel like they're doing so much for God, but they're not actually listening to what the Scripture says, what God has for them to hear and to, and to receive and to follow instruction. The fool doesn't care about any of that. They're just going to come and bring their big sacrifice. And I was saying, don't be like that fool. Come in, because he says, they consider not that they do evil. What good is your sacrifice going to do when you're out doing evil, God doesn't care about your sacrifice. He cares more, way more about your obedience. He wants you doing what's right. He wants you listening to him, receiving instruction. And when you come in to, to, to the house of God, be ready to hear. Yep. It's not wrong to give sacrifices, but, it, but that's, that's lower on the list. God wants you to receive instruction. Verse number two says, be not rash with thy mouth. Again, that would be like being hasty, just, just not using any discernment with the words that are coming out of your house. And let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. And this will continue on to talk about vow, making vows and making promises. You know, don't go and just open up your mouth and being hasty with, oh God, you know, if you do this, then I'll do that. And just making these, these vows unto God. God's going to hold you to that. So, so, Pay attention to what you're doing and, and let your word, the Bible says, just therefore let thy words be few. You're going to get a lot less trouble if you could just not say as much. Just hold it in. Use more thought. Um, you could say in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, I'm going to read for you from Proverbs uh, 17, verse 27. We're going to continue down in Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Proverbs 17, 27 says, He that hath knowledge spareth his words, and a man of understanding is of an excellent spirit. The Bible says if you actually have knowledge, you spare your words. Why? Because, why? because the Bible says here in verse 28, Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise. So you don't even have to have a lot of knowledge, but when you, when you don't just start blabbering and, and letting it whatever come out of your mouth, you're considered to be a wise person because you're not just letting everybody know the foolishness that's in your heart. And that's, that's talking about a fool here. They're, they're counted as wise. And he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. If you have knowledge, it's best not to say a lot because the, the, in the abundance of words, there, there wanteth not sin, the Bible says, that there's, there's, there's no lack of sin. The more, the more you speak, the more odds are that something dumb is going to come out of your mouth, something foolish. So it's best just to keep your words few. Spare your words. Continuing down here in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, look at verse number 3. The Bible says, For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by multitude of words. He says, you want to know a fool's voice? Just a person that just can't keep their mouth shut. Verse number four, when thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that, that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. 
Neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hands? For in the multitude of dreams and many words, there are also diverse vanities, but fear thou God. Flip over to Ecclesiastes chapter number 7. So we want to be careful with our words. The words is the biggest thing to being hasty with. Put a filter on your mouth. Think about the things you're going to say. Give thought to them before just opening up your mouth and just letting whatever is popping into your mind and popping into your heart just come right out. But the next thing I want to talk about is being quick to anger. Being quick to just, just being, you know, set off and being real quick to get angry. That's also not a good thing. Uh, look at Ecclesiastes 7, verse number 8. The Bible says, Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. So another reference to foolish, you know, if the person who can't keep their mouth shut and just babbles on, the Bible refers to them as being foolish, as well as a person who's hasty in their spirit to be angry and is just always being set off and always being angry. You know, the Bible teaches that we're supposed to be temperate in all things. Temperate means you're keeping control of yourself. You're keeping your temper, right? That's what you're being temperate means you're keeping your temper. You're holding your temper. You're not just flying off the handle. Every little thing doesn't just set you off. Now, there is a time to be angry. It's not just that being angry is a sin. Jesus Christ was angry. Jesus Christ made a whip and drove people out of the temple. There's times when God gets angry, Jesus got angry, you know, and that we can be, the Bible says, be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon thy wrath. So there's a time and a place for, for righteous indignation, for anger, but you ought not to just be getting set off and getting angry in your spirit just kind of on a regular basis or just real easily, really quickly. You need to have patience and learn patience. You know what? This is an important lesson for parents, too. It could be stressful raising children. It gets stressful when they, you know, they end up getting loud and break things and do things they're supposed to. Don't be hasty and quick just to anger. Because when you're quick to be angry, what's going to happen is you're going to, you know, when you discipline your children, you might not be having the control that you need, and, and that's where people end up abusing their children as opposed to correcting their children. You cannot properly discipline your child if when you're allowing yourself to get too angry because you could lose it. And that you do not want to do that. That's a very foolish thing to do. Obviously, you love your children, so you need to keep your emotion under control. You need to keep your anger under control and be able to, to look at things that happen. And if you have to, take a step back I'm not saying your child doesn't need to be corrected, but don't be going and grabbing the rod when you're full of anger and getting towards a rage, okay? That is not the right time to discipline your child. Because like I said before, that's, that's going to that's gonna lead to abuse. You're going to injure your child if you can't restrain yourself and, and keep yourself under control. Deal with your, with your own anger first and then go and discipline them as it's appropriate. Uh, James chapter 1. You stay in Ecclesiastes. Turn over to Proverbs chapter 14. I'm going to read from James because we're going to spend a lot of time in this Proverbs anyways. That's where the majority of the sermon is from this morning. James chapter 1 verse 19. The Bible says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. You know, we ought, like I said before, there's times to be angry, but we ought not to be characterized as angry people. You know, that's the way that the media wants to portray our church and other churches like us. Like, oh, like we're this hate group and we sit around hating all the time and hate, 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 hate. Look, there's a, there's a time for love and a time for hate. That's right. Amen. Amen. There's a time for war, there's a time for peace. Amen. There's a time to be angry. There's a time not to be angry. The time you're angry is, is much smaller than the rest of your time. So anger itself isn't a sin, but don't let yourself be quick to be angry. You should have a high threshold, right? The boiling point should be really high. You should be able to suffer, have long suffering 
that, that'll last for quite a while before you end up getting that, that anger. The Bible says in Proverbs 14, Proverbs 14, verse number 29, he that is slow to wrath is of great understanding, but he that is hasty of spirit exalteth folly. And again, there's a, another reference to foolishness. What folly is, it comes from the, the root word of a fool. If you're hasty in your spirit and just real quick to react or just to, to go, that's foolish. You need to be slow to wrath. If you're slow to wrath, you have great understanding. And if you could keep your spirit under control, keep your emotions under control, be temperate. You know, it, your emotions may not be wrong. You could, you know, you could be having a right, you know, even just being hasty in, in a lot of areas. You could be, you could be hasty, too hasty in, in a right thing, but you're going to end up failing if you just react too quickly without thinking, without thinking things through. And uh, we've got, I got one more area we're going to cover. Turn to Proverbs chapter 28. But at the end of the day, I, I just want people to, to consider the decisions you make. Consider your reactions. Consider appropriate responses before just reacting and just going with whatever. Think about things. Take a step back. And, and be, you know, be quick to hear, but be slow to speak. This applies to everyone, not, you know, not just me. When someone comes to you with even a question, right? And, you know, I'll use myself as an example, as a pastor. If someone comes to me with a question about the Bible or a question about something, you know, I need to be careful not to be quick just to give an answer because, oh, I'm the pastor, I need to give him an answer. If I don't know the answer, I shouldn't just be quick with my words and just start spouting off something so it just looks like I know what I'm talking about. I need to be able to say, I don't know. And, you know, it's not just me as pastor, that's husbands, fathers, you know, anybody, you know, you're going to have people come to you maybe looking for advice or things like that. You know, don't just just feel like you have to say something just to say something. Right? Consider it. Don't be hasty, but uh, but give thought to it. And if you don't know, you don't know. There's nothing. You know, it's way better to admit that you don't know something than it is to just give some answer that you don't know. The last point I want to cover here on being on being hasty, or being swift, is being swift to wealth or to getting money. We shouldn't be quick with our words, you know, in judgment and just in speaking. We also shouldn't be quick to being angry. But finally, we shouldn't be quick to just trying to make a buck and just seeking the, the fast way, the quick way to make money. Proverbs 28, verse number 19, the Bible reads, He that tilleth his land shall have plenty of bread, but he that followeth after vain persons shall have poverty enough. A faithful man shall abound with blessings, but he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. The Bible talks a lot about working hard and laboring and laboring by the sweat of your brow and putting in work. And when you put in honest work, and it is, it's going to be work, that's where you're going to receive your blessing. And when, and when God does bless you, he says, here, you know, you'll have plenty of bread. He that tilleth his land, tilling your land doesn't happen overnight. It was talking about here. It's a lot of work. You're going to have to grind up the ground. You know, you're spending hours and hours and hours and hours out there, and you don't yield the fruit thereof immediately either. You're investing, you're spending time, you're working, you're working, you're working. That's the right way to do things. And God says, you know what? You'll be blessed. Keep at it. Work hard and you'll be taken care of. You'll be blessed. Don't be getting this thing in your eye of saying, man, we got to get all this money. Look, oh, I get all this money real fast. Not only does it say that's not right, it says, he that maketh hate to be rich shall not be innocent. Notice that there's a difference there between working hard. It doesn't say anything about being guilty or being innocent. But it says, he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. You know why? Because there really isn't 
an innocent way to just make a whole bunch of money real fast. You're going to end up doing something wicked to, in order to, to get that you know, massive amounts of money real fast. And I just preached as a faithful word last week, but it was, it was an admonition to, to younger people. But don't be a sellout. You don't want to be a sellout, especially when it comes to just your own integrity and things that the Bible teaches and, and matters of faith. Because there are ways of making a lot of money really fast. They exist. Otherwise, it wouldn't even, it wouldn't even make sense to be in the Bible. If you, you know, people do make haste to be rich. But the people that make haste to be rich, they're selling out something about themselves. Drug dealers, they can make a lot of money real fast. But what are you doing? You're harming people. You're poisoning people. You're damaging people. You're ruining people's lives. When you don't care about someone else, yeah, sure, you can make a lot of money, but they're not innocent. The whore, the prostitute might be able to make a lot of money real fast. But they're selling out their body. And if you're saved, that's a temple of the Holy Ghost. There are plenty of ways to make money. You say, oh, make money at home. You know, from your computer. Yeah, promoting you know, mature adult, you know, they call it mature. How about smut? Right. Promoting filth. Promoting pornography. Right. That's how you're going to make a lot of money, but it's not worth it. Don't be a sellout and you're not going to be innocent. Right. Proverbs 21, verse number 5. Turn to Proverbs chapter 10. Proverbs 21, verse 5 says, The thoughts of the diligent tend only to plenteousness, but of everyone that is hasty, only to want. It's not even good to desire to have these riches and these riches real fast. That's covetousness, which in itself is a sin. You know, people... I've heard this, I don't know, for, for a long time, probably as long as I've been studying the Bible, it's about when it comes to gambling. People always say, was well, gambling wrong? Is it wrong? Because I don't see anything about gambling in the Scripture. I don't see gambling being wrong. Well, the Bible says that, you know, if you make haste to be rich, you're not going to be innocent. The Bible says that everyone that is hasty is only going to end up coming into want. The Bible talks about the, the love of money is the root of all evil. Very few people like to play the slot machines just because they like seeing the lights spin around and like playing the game. Right? The reason that makes it fun is that there's money involved and you're getting some kind of reward. And what do people look at? Why do you think they advertise the big jackpot is $500,000 or whatever, right? There's this huge amount of money because that's what people want to win. They want to go in there with, without having much money at all and walk away having all of this money. They want to make haste to be rich. Watch out for that. That is a sin. You're setting your eyes on things that you, you don't have and, you, and you're, you're putting a love of money in your heart. You have a covetous attitude. And that, that beware of that. Beware of that because that, that is going to lead you down a really, really, really bad path you don't even realize. When the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil, don't just let that statement go in one ear and out the other. You say, well, I don't understand. You don't have to understand how it's going to work. Just believe Scripture, believe God's Word. Because it does work that way, and that is true. Don't feel like you need to go through it to finally understand, oh, well, now I see what it's talking about, after you've already pierced yourself through with many sorrows. Don't think that that's the only sin that you'll commit when you start loving money. Because it's not. That's the beginning. It will lead you into many other things that you wouldn't think you'd ever do. Proverbs 10, look at verse number 3. The Bible says, The Lord will not suffer the soul of the righteous to famish, but he casteth away the substance of the wicked. He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. He that gathereth in summer is a wise son, but he that sleepeth in harvest is a son that causeth shame. This is talking about not being lazy, right? Be diligent. Work hard. When it comes to your wealth, when it comes to just 
obviously we all have to, to feed, be fed and be clothed and to, and to work in order to provide for ourselves and for our family. That's something that we have to do. First and foremost, as with everything, we rely upon God, right? We go to God, God, I need your help. God, please help me with this. You know, lead me in the path that I should go. Be seeking the Lord always. God, give me this day, my daily bread. You know, help me. Thank you, Lord, for providing for me. But then you, after you go to God first, you get up off your rear end and you get to work. And you work and you're diligent and you work hard and you work for whether it's your employer or you work for yourself. You serve as if you're serving the Lord and you work hard and whatever you you receive, you're thankful for. You're not always looking for something else and trying to make the fast buck. You know, when the Bible talks about the people, everyone that's hasty to be rich, it leads them to want. These are the people that are always buying those lotto tickets. Notice, you're never going to find the person who already has wealth going out and buying lotto tickets and, and flushing his money down the toilet. Because that's what you're doing when you buy those things. You're flushing your money down the toilet. It's always the people that can't afford the five bucks to buy those lotto tickets that are out spending the five dollars. If you just save your money, you wouldn't be in the situation you're in right now trying to get the fast money. Just be diligent in your work and be thankful with what you have and you'll be blessed for that. And this is, I'm not trying, I'm not preaching a prosperity gospel of, of, oh, you'll be a millionaire if you just, you know, that's not, that's not it at all. But over and over again, we get the promise from God that if you're doing what's right, you won't be, you won't be begging bread. You're not going to be allowed to hunger of the Lord. What else do you have to worry about then? I mean, really anything else you could just could probably just fall under the cat category of covetousness. You're clothed, you're fed, you're taken care of. What more do you need? Yeah. Nothing. You don't need anything. What more do you want? And that's the problem. And that's a problem in a lot of people's hearts say is I want this. I want that. I want, 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 want. Hold on a minute. Just get to work. And if God blesses you, praise God for that. If, you, if, you, if you're blessed financially, praise God for that. That's nice. Thank you, God. And if not, just keep working anyways. Don't make haste to be rich. The Bible says you make haste to be rich, you're not going to be innocent. Everyone that's hasty is going to end up coming to want. All those things that you want to have, you're going to be lacking. You want to make it rich? Be diligent in your work. If you're, if you're going to get, the, get the, the riches or whatever, at least just do it the right way. But don't set your heart on those things anyways. Because that's all just going to burn up and be gone. Here today, gone tomorrow. That's not what we live for. We don't live for money. We don't live for things. We live for God and live for people. Because that's what really matters. Kids can grow up in the best households with the least amount of money. And then you can have kids growing up with the most amount of wealth and having the worst family life. And those kids end up miserable. Doesn't matter how much money they have. Because the people is what matters, not the amount of money. Don't think that money is going to buy you happiness or security or anything. You don't need that. If you want to do things, turn if you would to Isaiah 28. It's the last place I'll have you look at this morning. Isaiah 28. If you want to do things the right way, it's going to require work and time. There's no way around that. Work and time. That's how you get things done the right way. The Bible does a lot of references to, you know, planting seeds and, and uses God's creation and nature to teach us things that are, that are of, uh, of great wisdom. Consider a huge oak tree, right? A really big trunk, huge branches. It goes up real high, right? Big tree, man, they're a lot of fun to climb. You could cut it down, use all that wood. You, you know, there's so many things you do with that big old 
strong tree, but it doesn't get that way overnight. It starts with the seed, right? The seed gets planted and it requires better conditions early on in order to be able to withstand the harsher conditions later, right? That big oak tree that, man, the winds are coming, it's blowing, you've got hurricanes, you've got storm coming, that thing's just solid, right? It's rooted down. It gets that way over time. It started with a seed. If you want to be strengthened and strong in this life, it doesn't happen overnight. It's going to take time. You need to get rooted down, get rooted in the Word of God. Gain wisdom and knowledge by reading and studying and listening, being swift to hear. You know, you don't need to go around teaching everyone else. You just, just how about just take some time listening first? You know, there's a lot of people who want to be real quick to teach, but not giving the time to listen and just study and just be that faithful servant. Be the Joshua to Moses. Be the Elisha to Elijah. These men, these great men that were great leaders that, that in their own right, in their own time, came into a position to be able to lead and teach, they all start humbly keeping their mouths shut, doing what's right, doing the work, and receiving and, and just, just doing things the, the old-fashioned, slow way of doing it. And in time, their time comes. And not, and not trying to push it before that time. The Bible says in Isaiah 28, verse number 9, Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. For with stammering lips another tongue will he speak to this people. That's how you're going to learn your Bible. And, and, you know, be careful not to be hasty to understand everything that you read so much that you're just going to go and search out everything on the Internet. Oh, I don't understand this verse and just go to the Internet. Well, what, is the, what does the Internet say? Oh, I don't understand this verse. Well, what does the Internet, on the Internet say? Let the Holy Ghost teach you. Okay, read, read the Bible. Before you even start studying and searching out all these other matters, why don't you just try reading your Bible cover to cover multiple times? And just read it and read it for yourself. And yeah, you know, go to church. It's not wrong to have instruction. My, my point is this, though. You don't want to be so hasty to just understand everything that you're doing it the real quick way because there's a lot of false teachers out there. There's a lot of false prophets. There's a lot of information out there. Unfortunately, a lot of it's bad information. And when you're real quick to just, to just start searching all this stuff out hastily without doing it the right way of just precept upon precept, start with the basics and build from there. Let's start with fundamental doctrines and start branching out from there. But that's where the root is. That's where the source is, is in the fundamentals. Let's get that down right. Let's make sure I, I understand. I've read the Word of God. I know what the stories are to not be susceptible to people taking things out of context or not as susceptible. Everybody is. Obviously, you know, everyone needs to take heed lest you fall. Everyone needs to pay attention. But get the solid foundation first of having read the Bible for yourself a few times and then start branching out and learning and learn the precept upon precept, line upon line. You're not going to get to the knowledge overnight and you have to be okay with that. You're going to learn. You're going to pick up here a little bit, there a little bit, here a little bit, there a little bit. You know, I've gone back in my own notes and stuff when I was much, much younger spiritually and looking at some of my notes, I kind of laugh thinking like, well, how could I have think, thought that? Well, I was just a babe in Christ. Now, it would be silly for me to go out and try to teach people when I, when I lacked so much understanding at that time but I just needed to learn. And everyone needs to learn. And I still need to learn. But we need to do it the right way and not just go out and try to have all of the answers right now. Because you're not going to have all the answers right now. Learn precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little.
So try not to be hasty. Keep a temper, keep control over your spirit, your mind, the things that you say, your, your emotions, being quick to anger, and just even when it comes down to your work and your, your income, your wealth, don't be, don't be quick in any of these matters. Take things, you know, we're, we're in this race as Christians as a, as a marathon, not a sprint. Keep that in mind. Do things solid the right way and, you know, don't be too quick to move. Let's bow our heads have a word of, word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all the guidance and instruction and wisdom that you give us through your word. Lord, I pray that you please help us to, to rein in our spirit and our emotions and help us to control our mouths. Lord, help us not to be too swift to, to speak, but that we would be swift to hear and to learn and understand and grow. Lord, we're asking you to, to increase our knowledge and our wisdom, Lord, to help us with that. And, and Lord, uh, none of us are perfect, but I pray that you would please just help us to be able to apply these principles to our lives that, that um, we can improve and, and be less foolish. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.